Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Human Services uh, Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, today, we will call this meeting to order. Uh, and with that, if we could start with the roll, Ms. Hansen. Chair Schultz. Present. Vice Chair Bonner. Present. Lead Albright. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Burkle. Burkle present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Long time no see. <laughs> Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Hansen. Hansen present. Representative Keel. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Thank you. Representative Moeller. Present. Representative Noor. Present. Representative Novotny. Novotny present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Representative Pinto, I don't think has joined us yet. Representative I, Rep. I'm just, I actually just did as you were saying okay. my name. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Representative Robbins. Thank you, I see Representative Robbins. Representative Sandell. Present. And Representative Schumacher. Schumacher present. Thank you, sir. We have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hansom. Uh, a quorum is present. And with that, would anyone like to move the minutes for 2-22-22? So moved, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Mueller. Uh, we will then go ahead and move the minutes. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Uh, with that, uh, members, we have on the agenda today, HF 3380, uh, Representative Hansen's bill. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move that HF 3380 be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee? Yes, please, Madam Chair, that is my motion. All right, perfect. All right, well, now that we have the bill before us, uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to go ahead and speak to your bill? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I come to you today with a bill that will have a huge impact on the lives of children throughout Minnesota, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. You know, the vast majority of people agree that foster care placement should be a last resort for children who cannot remain safely at their home with their primary caregivers. We know that children experiencing foster care are at a higher risk of negative outcomes later in life particularly when they remain in foster care for extended period of time, or if they age out without permanency. Preservation of a child's family and their connections to relatives and kid, kin, excuse me, it leads to improved child welfare outcomes for children and their families, which in turn can improve these long-term outcomes, not just for these children, but for generations. This bill seeks to do a lot of things. For example, it seeks to reduce the likelihood of unnecessary removals through greater court oversight and prevention efforts. It provides systemic and practice changes through an equity lens at multiple decision points. It improves the opportunities for families to ensure the safety of their children prior to them being removed from their homes. It places a greater emphasis on keeping children with their families rather than non-relative providers and it includes a cultural definition of kin. Compared to white children, American Indian and indigenous children were 16.4 times more likely, and African American and black children were 2.4 times more likely to be removed from their homes. And with children of two or more races, they were 6.8 times more likely to experience out of home care in 20. This legislation is going to impact all children in the child welfare system. However, given these numbers and the overrepresentation of Black and African American children in the child welfare system, we expect that this legislation would disproportionately benefit Black and African American children, as well as Indigenous children and families to whom ICWA does not apply. HF 3380 is intended to maintain family connections and relationships through improved family preservation and these relative placement efforts. Like I said, this bill does so many things and, and just a few of the additional pieces I want to highlight are that it strengthens that legal requirement for removing a child from their home 
by requiring that the details and description of actual agency efforts are in the court record. It includes that the, the assessment of safety as well as other alternative family or kin-based arrangements uh, were included in those court orders when there is an order for removal. It strengthens and clarifies that relative searches, the engagement and consideration process, the placement requirements for local agency staff and the court oversight of local agency efforts in this area are updated, modernized and reflect the best practices that we know exist. This bill will clarify that the safety plans and out of home placements must be individualized. And I can't emphasize that enough because individualized care and support produces better outcomes and it ensures that the court reviews these plans to consider whether these services and actions were culturally appropriate, individualized, and selected collaboratively with the child and family. Members, I could talk about this bill all day. It's very important to me and to a number of people in our communities, um, but I have DHS here to answer any questions that you might have. I would also direct members to the committee documents that were submitted uh, to see a breakdown of all of the changes that this bill proposes. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to members um, or DHS if they have any comments to make as well. You're on mute, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Partly my button does not want to push here. I appreciate that. Um, I am actually going to briefly, before we move on to the testifiers, I am going to briefly hand the gavel over to Chair Schultz. Uh, for a few minutes, uh, because I need to attend to something, uh, but that way we can keep us moving. All right, with that, Rep our Chair Schultz, I will hand it to you. Thank you, Vice Chair Bonner. So the first uh, testifier we have is Angie Tice. Are you with us? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm um, Angie, Angie Tice, and I am the Association of Minnesota Counties Child Wellbeing Policy Analyst here today representing the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators in a state supervised county administered system. It will be the human service administrators that implement this language. Um, I'm here today to say that we share and support the goals of the bill and are committed to working with the author and with the department um, to make the necessary changes. Um, we have a, a meeting later this week and would like to call attention to a couple of areas um, that we have questions about, um, specifically around the intersection of the language with law enforcement, um, legislating best practices, and clarifying uh, actions, which also leads to um, a, a presumption that we have a, an appropriate uh, service array across the state of Minnesota that can support families before out-of-home placement is needed. And with that, um, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Ms. Teese. And I assume, I don't know if Rep. Hansen wants to respond to that. I'm assuming you will work with the rep, each other and DHS on those issues. Representative Hansen. Of course, Madam Chair, the more the merrier, the better we can make our bills, the better the families and children who are impacted by them will be. Okay, are there questions from members? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Representative Hanson, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, I don't think that you would get any disagreement about the need to protect those that are most vulnerable amongst us. I do have several questions and uh, I understand that this bill is moving to judiciary. So some of those probably are pertinent to that. Uh, and Madam Chair, I, I guess the first question, I, I under, understand that this bill does or has had a fiscal note requested of it. Do you happen to know uh, when that might be coming to us or the next committee or what, what is the status of that? Once we have the fiscal note, which I don't have the status of, I don't know if Rep. Hansen knows, um, we will bring that fiscal note back to this committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen, uh, in, in the body of the bill, you outline uh, a number of changes in terms of the responsibility by county workers in terms of uh, placement, particularly uh, a couple I, I point out to you. One is that you are now uh, requiring a diligent effort as opposed to any effort, uh, any efforts. 
but then you're also uh, suggesting that a higher burden uh, is is actually placed on counties if they don't pr uh, demonstrate a reasonable efforts to avoid an out of family placement. What is your opinion in terms of whether or not that could cause the potential for litigation between uh, county services and the, the families that are involved? Or Panson. Thank you, Representative Albright, for the question. I am a, I'm self-proclaimed not an attorney, so I do not want to step too far, far into this, but we do have some staff from DHS and Child and Family Services who may have a really great answer for you. Um, and if they don't, I commit to finding the answer for you and, and coming back. Um, as you know, my background is in social work and speaking with you know others who work in this field, there are changes that are needed and we're looking forward to that, but uh, I, I'm not, privy to having the answers to answer a legal question like that, but I would love to get the professionals involved who can. I don't know if, if um, you need to express your opinion or speculate on this that you may not know, but I, we do have Ms. Baum here from DHS if she wants to respond to Representative Albright's question. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, my name is Autumn Baum, and I am the legislative lead for Child Safety and Permanency at the Department of Human Services. I cannot answer uh, the question related to the likelihood of litigation just off the top of my head. Um, I'm happy to look into the question some further, or further, um, but I do not know how this particular piece um, would impact litigation. I'm sorry. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, Ms. Baum, uh, in addition to that, I find uh, there's a notation that said the courts would be barred from finding an agency made reasonable efforts to prevent placement based on claims that no service or effort would have been, had made it safe for a child to remain in the home. Uh, what if the family objects? Ms. Baum? Madam Chair, Representative Albright, could you refer to line numbers in the bill just so I can know precisely where you're looking? I, I will get that to you. Uh, it might require a longer uh, conversation on that. My final question, Madam Chair, in terms of the bill itself, and this would be either for Ms. Baum or uh, Representative Hansen, but it seems as if the bill gives greater deference to the families involved in the child protection system. Um, and, and obviously we, we wanna honor uh, those wishes as well, uh, but I am a bit troubled by, uh, or at least uh, confused by, in the, in the setting where a child is at risk and you're suggesting that they collaborate with the family uh, at the time of an outplacement or finding a safe and secure place for the child. How, it seems like there's a contradiction there between speaking with the same people who might be putting the child at risk and the best interests of the child it's, uh, themselves. So help me understand how that collaboration with the family works. Rep. Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Albright. That's an important question. And what I'd like to say is I'd like to stand up for social workers and caseworkers everywhere where we do have extensive training in how to do the right thing and how to work alongside families because family preservation is and should always be the goal because that's the type of rehabilitation and supportive services that a person-centered approach takes and so i will you know encourage folks to you know look at the the, the values and ethics of the people who do this work they are the glues of society that hold a lot of us together. And I think it's important to honor that their decision-making and the best practices that they follow are there. I don't know if uh, Ms. Tice would like to also comment on that question, but I think this is a question we learn a lot in our training um, as we go through these procedures. So these are decisions that are not made lightly or with blanket decisions. Um, they are individualized case, case plans. And each family is going to have unique needs and each child will have unique needs. And there is a value that is placed on hearing from the child's family first. And uh, with that, I would open it up to any other commenters who would like to um, comment on that. Thank you, Rep. Hansen. Thank you, Rep. 
All right. Sounds like this will get um, more questions in judiciary as well. So I encourage Representative Albright to uh, contact Rep. Hansen and maybe work offline. We have a, uh, three more people with questions and then we'll move on. Representative Sandell. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and Representative Hansen, I appreciate your comments in caucus yesterday and I thought your presentation today was terrific. I agree with uh, um, um, Representative Al Albright about how important this bill is. I have three quick questions because I know so little about the topic. One is, uh, is there a pattern in the um, reasons that children are um, uh, most frequently um, caused to leave their family? Is there a pattern in the ages uh, at which uh, the young kids are, are taken away from their family? And my third question is, once removed from a family, uh, uh, their birth family anyway, uh, do the birth parents have a chance or, or uh, what is the relationship between the birth parents and, and the children while they're placed with another family? Thanks and uh, good luck on this, this uh, great effort. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sandell. I'm going to go to Rep. Hansen or Ms. Baum from DHS. Chair Schultz, I would love to defer okay. to, uh, to uh, Ms. Graham on this. Ms. Baum, can you answer Representative Sandell's three questions? Good morning, Representative Schultz. I'll take this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Sommerfeld, please proceed. Thank you. So I'm Jennifer Sommerfeld from the Department of Human Services, and I will probably, Representative Sandell, have to ask you to repeat your questions um, just to make sure I'm covering them all. Um, it's my recollection from recent data that one of the primary reasons that people are reported to child protection is neglect. But what I can do after this hearing, and I think we already are putting it together for a hearing that took place the other day, I will send the committee uh, links to our current um, most recent out-of-home placement and maltreatment reports that provides a great deal of data on that area. Representative Sandell, would you like to repeat the other two questions? Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. I, uh, my questions are just because I know so a little bit about uh, a little of the issue. The, the besides the reasons that children are removed, uh, is there a pattern to ages? Are, are are very young children more frequently removed from home, uh, or is it older kids? Uh, uh, and the other question is: once uh, with a, a placement family, does the birth family have uh, uh, opportunities or uh, uh, a chance to uh, meet and spend time with the child? Ms. Sommerfeld. Madam Chair, thank you, Representative Sandell. Members, um, I do not have any data with me today on the ages, but we do have that same data included in our out-of-home placement and our maltreatment reports. So we will provide that to the committee and I'll break out the, in an email, make sure we break out the pieces of information that are specific to your questions so that you don't need to read through the entire report to locate them. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, so I'll say this is my understanding of how this works. I think when children are removed from their home, they're involved with, with their parents is probably case specific, right? We have cases where children have uh, visitation with their parents. I don't know if that happens in every case, but I think that's more of a case by case basis um, decision on how that involvement goes. And while I have the floor, I'll really quickly clarify that this bill is policy only. It does not have a cost. So I thought I'd make sure that that question was answered right now, if I can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sommerfeld, and thank you, Rep. Sandell. It sounds like they're going to get you the information that you seek. Um, I think Representative Moeller wants to respond to Representative Albright, so we'll go to Representative Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just really quickly, I um, wanted to respond to the comment about the diligent efforts made, um, that that was somehow new language, and there are a couple of paragraphs where that word diligent is added, but I was looking back at the bill and it's already in statute at lines 13.4, 19.9, 19.11, and 40.30, I believe. So that's not a new concept. Um, he still asked a great question and, and we'll be looking forward to seeing this bill in the Judiciary Committee where that can be followed up on. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Mulder. And it sounds like Rep. Pinto may also want to comment on Rep. Albright's question. I, thank you, Madam Chair, and I and I do, um, but sort of from a different angle. Just um, this is mostly just my own thinking. To share that I I feel um, uh, the my understanding from an early childhood perspective. I think the youngest kids are those um, who are most likely to be removed and the most physically at risk. Um, and that it, the relationship with the family, um, Representative Albright and colleagues, um, I think the research shows is incredibly important, even in a situation where it may be a, a pretty challenging situation. As, as Ms. Summerfield said, 
Um, often kids are removed because of neglect as opposed to abuse, but even in an abusive situation, um, that bond with the family is so incredibly important. And I think it fits our intuition that, that uh, birth families should have um, a real stake and a say in what goes on with kids um, from sort of a, from the rights of the parent perspective. But even if all you care about is what is going to be best for that individual child, and I'll say that for me, that's incredibly important. Um, the research shows that the relationship with that birth family and the input from the birth family um, actually is really, really important in terms of that the welfare of the individual child as well. So I really appreciate this um, this bill moving forward from that perspective. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you for sharing your expertise, Rep. Pinto. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair Schultz. As you might imagine, I'm concerned about the emergency placement uh, provisions and uh, the diligent searches that can be done Monday through Friday, nine to five, uh, through the working social workers, I understand, uh, having been involved in numerous emergency removals of children in the past, uh, I'm concerned about some of the provisions coming up and the, the risks that are taking. Um, what position are we putting these uh, officers that are in, on, the, on the scene at uh, two o'clock in the morning on, on a weekend that they're going to be placing that child in a situation that is safe? Um, not knowing the dynamics of the household and who lives there in the background, uh, what, what provisions are there going to be to make sure that uh, these officers aren't going to be unknowingly placing children in a um, situation that's no better or worse than they are removing them from. Representative Hansen, would you like to respond? I think it's a really valid question, Madam Chair and Representative Novotny. I, you're, I know that you have a had shared a personal experience from your community. And I think that's really valid because the stories of these kids are their life, their life story. Um, so I would defer for the specifics about your policy question to go to uh, uh, Ms. Baum, but I just wanna acknowledge the uh, importance of it and that this is not something that is taken lightly. And, and you're right, there are really hard decisions that have to be made at really hard times. So. Ms. Baum or Ms. Sommerfeld like to respond to Representative Novotny's question. Ms. Sommerfeld. Madam Chair, I believe uh, Heidi Ambisa Scallett uh, from our staff at CSP is going to um, speak to this. And also I will add that this is one of the issues that Ms. Tice raised um, from the county perspective. So we are going to continue doing some work on this particular portion of the language. But if Heidi is available, she should be able, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Mbisa Scallet is available. She should be able to answer a little more specifically about the policy. Okay. I didn't get your last name, Ms. Skyle. If you're here, introduce um, yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Yes. Um, so my name is Heidi Mbisa Scallet, and I am the Adoption and Kinship Policy Specialist at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And um, I can help address this question. Um, so currently in the state law, um, what it says is that the uh, peace officer at the time of you know, taking the child into the custody, um, that they are to notify the parent or custodian that they can request that the child be placed with a relative or a designated caregiver um, under chapter 257A rather than in a shelter care facility. So what this um, proposed language would do is it would then require the peace officer to ask the parent or custodian, and then um, it also adds the child, if appropriate, um, if they would like to make that request. And if they do then make the request that um, they, you know, the peace officer would honor that request. And the purpose around that is to help the child feel that they are in a, a place where they know the person, they are comfortable being there, um, but it does not require the peace officer to then place the child in a home if, you know, after they are able to locate, if they get the address, if they get the name, and they go to the home and they are unable to determine whether it is safe, um, then they, it's not requiring that the peace officer leave them there, um, because we also don't want to remove a child from an unsafe situation and then place them in a new unsafe situation. So there is the ability for the peace officer to determine that there, there could be a safety risk and then um, either take the child to the home of a different relative or designated caregiver if there is one that was named and they are available 
And then if, if there is no relative or designated caregiver available, that um, the peace officer would then take the child to a shelter care facility. So the purpose around it, again, is just to try to maintain um, some sense of normalcy, I guess, or um, you know, comfort so that the child, um, we can kind of minimize that trauma of the removal in the first place. Thank you, Ms. Scallett. Representative Otney, follow up. Thank you, Chair. Um, and that and that gets to my my concern. Um, Representative Hansen, you indicated that social workers have a lot of experience and training in this. And uh, peace officers, I like to describe them as uh, jack of all trades, masters of none. You you're putting even more responsibility on them and you're asking them to see into the future and make a prediction uh, about what's going on. Like I said, at in the dark of the night with little access and um, I, I understand that the welfare of the child is the most important thing, but keep in mind that you know we're not going into a home. It, the fact that we're there involved in emergency removal uh, indicates in most cases that uh, the child has already been traumatized and we need to get stabilized first. Um, and I'll wrap just by saying that, you know, if this was a first aid situation, we need to stop the bleeding before we can worry about physical therapy. So with that, thank you for bringing the bill forward. As always, the, the welfare of the child is the most important uh, to me and, and uh, that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Otney. Uh, Representative Pearson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you know, again, I, I think uh, Representative Novotny's point is, is well taken. I, I guess my concern, having gone through the system of, of becoming a licensed foster care provider in the state of Minnesota uh, and knowing the standards that, that are really uh, held to somebody who is taking care of somebody, that's the responsibility of the state because that, that child's been removed. You know, I, I, I appreciate Rep Hansen's uh, goal here of, of reducing that trauma on the child. And I, th I think that that's a, a lofty goal. It's certainly something we want to minimize the impact and, and uh, all of these things are happening. But uh, again, looking at or having gone through that process, there's some minimum standards that, that are required. And I, I guess, you know, from basic things like having to have a fire extinguisher in my home or having to have my hot water heater temperature turned down so a child can't burn themselves. The long and extensive process that the interviews and the, you know, of each of my family members, uh, the, the standards that we have for that um, in contrast to, I, I guess I wanna know what our minimum standards here are for uh, placing, a, placing a child in, in these types of situations. And, and uh, again, I appreciate you bringing this bill forward because I, I do recognize the uh, reduction in the trauma for, for the child who, you know, through no fault of their own is, is having to go through an, an extremely uh, grueling situation. And, and unfortunately, um, I, I just want to make sure we're, because again, they're words of the state in a way. I mean, they're they're being taken care of by the state at that point, and and we're responsible for them. Um, so I want to make sure we're we're doing our due diligence there. Thank you, Represent Pearson. Representative Hansen, if you want to respond and say some last words about the bill, and then we'll move to a roll call vote. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you. And Representative Pearson, I think that's important. I'll send you a follow up email as well uh, to, to to address your question. And in closing, members, I just want to say thank you. I know this is a big lift. It is a lot of work to make sure we're reducing disparities and doing what's best for our kids. And at the end of the day, regardless of what letters behind our name or which way we vote, like I've said before, this is a nonpartisan issue and kids need us to step up and do the right thing. And so I'm really proud to get to serve on this committee with you all. I'm really proud that you all have such a commitment to the future of our kids, especially those who are most vulnerable. So thank you again. And with that, Madam Chair, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Representative Hanson. I know you will work well with the counties and others um, and other legislators to work on this bill to address their concerns um, as it moves to judiciary. So thank you. I know your heart is in the right place. 
Um, and I'm confident you can um, work on the language to appease the counties and others. So with that members, we're gonna take a roll call vote. Ms. Hansen, chair votes aye. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna renew my motion to re-refer House File 3380 to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee and the chair votes aye. Saltz aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Aye. Bonner aye. Lead Albright. Yes. Albright aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden aye. Bolden aye. Representative Burkle. Aye. Burkle aye. Thank you. Representative Fisher. Fisher aye. Fisher aye. Thank you. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick aye. Representative Hansen. Hansen aye. Hansen aye. Representative Keel. Keel aye. Keel aye. Representative Liebling. Liebling aye. Liebling aye. Representative Moller. Aye. Moller aye. Representative Noor. Noor aye. Noor aye. Representative Novotny. Aye. Novotny aye. Representative Pearson. Pearson aye. Pearson aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen aye. Rasmussen aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Robbins aye. Representative Sandell. Aye. Sandell aye. Representative Schubacher. Um, one second. Well, Chair Schultz, that's 18 ayes and one excused. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. The motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Okay, the next bill we have before us is House File 1754, and the motion will be to lay this over for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Representative Frederick, I believe this is the continuing care for older older adults technical policy bill that we heard last year and sounds like you have an amendment. Would you like to make a motion to amend House File 1754 with the A22 amendment? So move, Madam Chair. Okay, members, this is a voice vote. Please unmute yourself. All those in favor of adopting the amendment to House File 1754, this is the A22 amendment. Is this is that the correct amendment number, Yangya, Ms. Fang? Um, it will be A22-0325 because Thank there you. are two A22. Okay, I'm sorry, members. This is the A22-0325 amendment. All those in favor of adopting this amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Now, Representative Frederick, please explain your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, as the chair pointed out, this bill we heard last year. Uh, and so the amend amendment I'll kind of focus on describing uh, what it does is in the omnibus last year, we said that remote day services uh, were something that could be continued during the pandemic. But the feedback that the department have gotten and I've gotten as well, uh, is that they want to be able to continue this, that different providers throughout the state want to be able to provide uh, remote day services going forward, even after we get past this pandemic. Um, it's not going to be just remote, it's going to be in addition to. Um, and so I think that is a good thing as we see, and I think there's going to be other things like it that we see going forward and more people offering more tele everything. Uh, and this is just one of those things. Um, so I guess with that, I would turn it over to the, to the department for any comments. Thank you, Representative Frederick. We have available to answer questions, um, members from DHS. And I'm not sure, do we have any testifiers here? I know we have a long list of folks that can answer questions. I'm seeing just folks that can answer questions. So, so let's go to um, questions. Representative Albright. And I'm sure I believe uh, Representative Liebling was first. Oh, sorry, Chair Liebling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright. It would have been fine for you to go first. But anyway, I just wondered if someone from DHS could just give us an example of what this looks like. I have trouble just kind of seeing in my head what we're talking about here when we do these services remotely. I, I, you know, I'm not quibbling with it. I just would really like to have a better mental picture if someone could provide that. Thank you. Looks like Ms. Stockard has appeared. Ms. Stockard? 
Thank you, Chair Schultz and uh, Representative Liebling for your question. Uh, Nicole Stockert with the Department of Human Services. Uh, Representative Liebling, that's a very good question. This is actually um, a continuation of a waiver that we put in place for, um, uh, as it was a COVID waiver. Um, and so what happened was um, this is services that they can basically provide remotely without having to go into the uh, center for services. So this would be things like socialization, activities. Um, you can connect with your caregiver. This is intended to be an interactive two-way with audio and video. So it's not something where you can just um, you know, send a text. But this is, these are, there's actually quite a few uh, services that can be provided remotely and they have been um, uh, quite successful in providing flexibility to these providers throughout the pandemic. And we'd be happy to get you some more examples of um, success stories that um, have been very helpful throughout the pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Docker. Chair Liebley? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna let other members have the floor to ask their questions too, but I wonder then how we evaluate the effectiveness of this as compared to on-site services, because I mean, we know that for our kids, for example, you know, people are saying all the time that doing remote learning, while it's not, you know, it has value, it's not the same. There's a socialization piece that's missing, for example. And so anyway, I just um, kind of, you know, still am kind of lacking a full understanding of how this can really be a substitute. And I understand it's not meant to be a complete substitute, but there's still a little missing piece for me, but I'm gonna let other members have the floor and ask their questions too, so thank you. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and I am gonna uh, kind of uh, springboard from what Representative Liebling said. Um, you know, I understand that some of this uh, intention is to connect with uh, individuals um, more expediently, more effectively, and so my first question to uh, either Representative Frederick or the representative from DHS is, is this intentioned to uh, locate or provide for cost savings to the program or is it uh, for other intentions? And, and with that, uh, is there the propensity in, in any shape, way, shape or form that there might be uh, fraud involved or the, the, the lack of transparency for the services offered. Um, we've often said that this is a very difficult time to deal with uh, you know, certain you know, behavioral uh, issues and uh, of the mental health variety in a two-dimensional world. So how can we feel competent to uh, provide those services or notice uh, changes in the behavior of individuals when we're dealing remotely as opposed to, as I think Representative Liebling suggested, that in some cases it is um, incredibly beneficial to be uh, in person and, and maybe just for routine, but to observe other situations that might not come to, uh, um, come to the fore if you're just, you know, in a Brady Bunch call. If we have Assistant Commissioner Pollock that may, or Representative Frederick, you want to tackle that first? Oh, yep, I'll defer uh, to Representative Frederick. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, if I can just put something in here real quick. Yep. Uh, if you were to go like six to eight blocks directly behind me, uh, there was a uh, building that worked for MR, or the building that was occupied uh, by an organization called MRCI here in Mankato. And it was a facility designed for day programming for individuals with varying levels of disabilities. And uh, they would come together as uh, Ms. Stocker would talk about from a socialization aspect, but there's also skills training and other opportunities there for these individuals. Uh, and what we saw during the pandemic is that, and even be prior to the pandemic, sometimes mobility was an issue uh, just to get some of these, depending on each person's situation, physically there. Uh, and so part of this amendment language would say that these services uh, can continue to be remote as long as there's like a two-way video to try to encourage that socialization aspect uh, uh, in specific cases. I don't, uh, to Representative Albright's point of being in person, yes, I think everyone can be on board and being supportive of that and say, yes, if that is available, if the person has the capability of getting there, if they don't have their own challenges, uh, we, we wanna make sure that we can be as, 
re responsive uh, to the individual cases as possible. So having the option uh, for being remote, I think is what is the goal uh, of the amendment. Assistant Commissioner Pollack, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Frederick said it well. I just would uh, draw Representative Albright's attention to page four of the amendment. Um, it's actually the, the 0326 amendment, um, but that delineates some of the licensing requirements that this bill is imposing on remote day providers. And, and like Representative Frederick said, this is a, a voluntary option um, that really is has, during the pandemic, I think, helped to fill some of the the gaps and the needs as we've lost a tremendous number of providers, um, you know, unfortunately in this space. So it's, it's really something that is a, a good option for people. It's not required for them and it does give, uh, you know, some benefit. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then I'm, I'm a bit confused and either for uh, Mr. Pollock or Mr. Um, Representative Frederick, but the way that I read the bill and uh, as amended, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't the bill specifically prohibit services whose main purpose is socialization? Representative Frederick or Assistant Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair. Do you, have a, do you have a line number, Representative Albright? I'm, I'm rifling through the pages, uh, Madam Chair, and as soon as I find it, I'll, I'll bop in. Um, Madam Chair, I think the point is to offer remote day services as part of their care plan. And so there's a minimum in-person requirement that's quarterly. Um, this is a licensed service, so they're subject to OIG oversight. And then and this service is, is provided to the person, you know, as part of a care plan that they've received from their county caseworker. Okay, Representative Albright, do you want to, should we come back to you, Representative Albright? I'm looking for it. Okay. Let's go to Representative Muller while you look for that. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I remember when we were um, talking about the waiver for this during the COVID, um, when we were dealing with COVID and talking to one of my um, day providers and hearing that they actually had some folks who um, that really benefited from the remote, like people who had a lot of anxiety about being around other people, um, that this was useful for them to do this remote setting. Um, and so I'm really excited about this bill because I think it really helps people who want to be in person, but then also those who it might work better for them to receive these services remotely. It's kind of like what we're doing in the business community too. People are really learning the things that worked well, maybe during the pandemic, there were many things that didn't, but some, some of the benefits and things that worked well, trying to implement those moving forward in the business community. I think it's the same kind of thing for this. For some folks, um, this might actually work better. And so I'm really excited um, that this opportunity is out there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Moeller. Representative Albright. Still looking, so okay. uh, we'll, we'll just come, we'll go to I'll take my hand down. Okay, we'll go to Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Frederick. I, I think this can work well, but I'm just very concerned for families who want the in-person that their provider will kind of, you know, almost forced them into the teleservices. During COVID, I had so many complaints from constituents, especially of adult um, people with disabilities who felt like they were just left out in the cold and now, um, even now, are not getting in-person services. And it's just been incredibly frustrating and um, in some cases dangerous. People have, um, acted out and been harmful. So I, I just want to have on the record that this is completely voluntary and completely patient cho choice. Thank you for that comment, Ms. Representative Robbins. Can you speak to that? Is it is it very clear that this is only if the client wants it to be remote? Assistant Commissioner or Representative Frederick? Um, I will say that I would every in a lot of these decisions, it's not up to just any one person. There can be treatment teams of people involved, in, in, depending on the situation. Uh, and you know, I, I know in some cases, two people can decide one day that they want to attend things virtually, uh, and the next because of whatever might be going on in their lives, and the next time they may be able to choose to be in person. Um, it, it should be a collaborative thing. I there's part of me that wants to differentiate between. 
uh, some of the decisions that were made specifically during the pandemic that I, I can't speak to any, you know, one organization's choice of why they, you know, may have, you know, shut down or moved to everyone being uh, remote. That could have been a choice that they made because they wanted to be what they felt was in the best interest of everybody, but kind of looking forward to what this bill is doing is just saying that they want to be able to have that option and in how individual providers, you know, uh, operate. I, again, it's a focus on being uh, in person as much as possible, but again, that could be a different in, in, in every individual case because we're talking, I mean, as we all know, right, when it comes to disabilities, there is a very wide range of how that presents. Um, and so I don't want to like say it's going to be just you know, black and white, but uh, as much as possible, I think everyone can agree that it can be a good thing to be in person, um, but this would just be an, an option that would be available. So just to clarify- I'll present who, Robbins. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, just to clarify, is it the patient choice to participate remotely or is it the provider choice? Representative Frederick. I, you know, I'm just gonna say, let's have the, the department way in here. Sure, Assistant there. Commissioner Pollock. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Robin, so it is the it is the participant's choice. That's on line 4.14. But I, I just want to add, this this industry has really gotten hammered. We've lost 50% of the provider capacity. So there may be large parts of the state where if you decline the remote adult day service, there may not be anything even close to you. Um, so, you know, we need to acknowledge that. That's part of this. I, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> Chair's already talked about that. The, restoring the workforce and rebuilding, you know, these industries that got wiped out um, as part of the committee's work. But this bill that's in front of you gives the option of remote adult day to continue. Without this bill, we have to turn this off. We wouldn't even be able to offer this option into the future. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Representative Robbins. I'm good, thank you. Okay, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and for um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, as well as the representative uh, reference to line 2.24, which defines the adult daycare services by reference to 245A.02, which does not include uh, socialization. And I'll read from that uh, section. Adult daycare, adult day services, and family adult day services do not include programs where adults gather or congregate primarily for purposes of socialization education, supervision, caregiver respite, religious expression, exercise, or nutritious meals. So I, I, I think there's gonna be some necessary uh, modification to this as you move forward because you're contradicting, uh, uh, y your presentation contradicts what's in, in statute. Thank you for pointing that out, Representative Albright. Assistant Commissioner Pollock, would you like to respond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Albright, you're referencing their um, underlying licensure requirements. And so that is correct. A, an adult day program cannot be primarily for the purpose of socialization or the other um, items that are delineated in 245A.02. Those would be, uh, if that was the only thing that they were doing, then that would not qualify as adult day. And that would be something that the licensing um, authorities would be asking the, pro the provider to document. Thank you for that. Representative Albright, any fo final follow-up? Uh, just in response to uh, uh, the Deputy Commissioner, the conversation, the presentation of this bill uh, was heavily uh, weighted towards the socialization aspect. Um, and I understand that, that your representation of the licensure certainly dictates for other services to be provided at the same time. But when a bill is represented, in such a fashion that telehealth is intended to provide for that very specific uh, point of being licensed to provide, I think you've got a problem. And so I would hope that Representative Frederick would undergo a consideration of either modifying his bill or undertaking an amendment to statute to remedy that situation. Thank you, Representative Albright. And I do hear some concerns and I'm confident uh, Representative Frederick and the agency can work with our legislators um, and reminding people that this whole bill will be uh, laid over so we, you do have time to work on it. Representative Albright, your hand is up again. Just stretching. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, Representative Frederick, final words. Oh, you know, before you do that, I, I made a mistake in the amendment number. So I have to make a new motion to unamend House File 37, House File 1754 with the A22-0325 and amend it with the correct amendment, which is the A22-0326. So we'll have to redo the voice vote. So all in favor of the motion that I just stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and that amendment, the A22-0326 is adopted. And we have unamended House File 1754 with the A22-0325. Okay, Representative Frederick, two final comments on your bill. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you everyone for the discussion. I know that we talked about socialization a lot, uh, but I would also say that even when we're having committees, the time before uh, and after, you know, there's people that are hanging around and we're having a conversation there. And so the socialization is a part, but I wouldn't say that it's a primary focus. There is a lot of skill building. And uh, I think that giving providers options uh, such as remote, uh, or remote options are a good thing. I think that, uh, as was pointed out too, if we don't give some providers these options, then some people people may not have any option. Period. Um, so I would just thank everyone for uh, their support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Frederick. So the motion um, is to lay House File 1754 as amended um, over for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Thank you, members. Next, we have House File 1432. This is for information only. Only this is the Vulnerable Adults Act redesign policy that we heard in committee last year. This bill is currently still in judiciary. Um, so we'll take official actions when it comes back to our committee. So Representative Frederick, this is again your bill and you do have an amendment, the A22-0325, if you wanna explain that. All right, there we go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this bill we heard last year uh, kind of focuses on redesigning the Vulnerable Adult Act. It's been about 40 years since it's been touched. Um, and so it, it brings it up to, to the current time frame. Uh, and what we know is that when it was written 40 years ago, the focus was kind of in, in congregate living facilities in, in that uh, it, it had a heavy focus on people that were receiving care somewhere. Uh, and that if someone who was taking care of them was, you know, whether it's uh, financial, exploita financial exploitation, abuse, or neglect. And uh, this uh, bill then uh, kind of focuses on what has happened, what we've learned in the last few years, that self-care is a very real thing that kind of has come to the forefront of the conversations in the last few years, and that people who are living uh, alone by themselves uh, are not, because of the pandemic, because of that isolation, are not necessarily taking care of themselves as, as well as we would hope they would. And so this uh, helps counties and enables them to be able to provide help and services, uh, however that is appropriate. Um, in some of the, in the amendment uh, that is being offered, uh, looks at when allegations of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation uh, is, are made, uh, how we go about making some of these um, investigations. And we wanna make sure that all Minnesotans, regardless of race, uh, ethnicity, any of it, uh, get the attention needed when there is an allegation. Um, and it, it doesn't, so right now, if, if someone, another piece of the bill is actually when there is a report of maltreatment that it used to be that the individual counties could set up a reporting number, but if you had one worker that maybe worked in two or three counties, you might have to learn two or three different ways to make that report of maltreatment. And so this bill uh, would actually make it one standardized process that they call the centralized reporting line saying, hey, share the story. Uh, and so the new process then would be that the state, uh, that centralized reporting line gets the report they do a, a screening process, screen in the report or screen out the report. Um, if there's not enough information, whatever that reason may be. Um, and then from there, if they screen in the report for an investigation, it goes down, down to the counties. Uh, the counties then will get that, then they can do their own screening of yes, they are going to conduct an investigation or no, they are not gonna conduct an investigation. Um, and right now looking at the numbers, when it gets to that county level, 
uh, if the vulnerable adult is white or Caucasian, then more than 40% of the time, uh, there is going to be an investigation. If that vulnerable adult is black or Afri African American, then you're talking around like 20% of the time there's an investigation that gets conducted. And so while the amendment doesn't want to eliminate the county's ability to do the screening process, what we do, what the hope is anyways, is that we can standardize that process to try to close uh, some of that disparity. Thank you for that explanation. We also have Ms. McGurin, I believe, from the agency, if you want to add to uh, any explanation of the amendment before us. Good morning, Madam Chair. Yes, we have a, a informational uh, PowerPoint that Nicole Stockard is, is lining up here and we'll just walk through um, a little bit of foundational information here. So I'm Mary McGurin and I'm a licensed social worker um, and the supervisor for adult protection here at the Department of Human Services. So first let's talk about what is the Vulnerable Adult Act or the VAA. At the highest level, the Vulnerable Adult Act establishes state policy for the protection of adults who are especially vulnerable to abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation because they receive services licensed by the Department of Health or the Department of Human Services, or because they're an older adult with an impairment or a person with a disability living in the community and they're not able to do what's necessary to maintain their own health. The vulnerable adult also creates the standard, the centralized system for mandated reporters and the public to report suspected maltreatment. And that's the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center operated by the Department of Human Services. The Vulnerable Adult Act also identifies which agency is responsible to respond to reports of suspected vulnerable adult maltreatment for the protection of the vulnerable adult. And if the person isn't receiving services that are licensed by DHS or the health department, the county is responsible for adult protective services. Next slide. So this, this slide shows in addition to defining who a vulnerable adult is, the Vulnerable Adult Act establishes categories and definitions of maltreatment. And each of these types of maltreatment has a detailed definition under the Vulnerable Adult Act. Next slide. In Minnesota, like the rest of our human services system, we have a county administered adult protection system. This contrasts with the majority of states who have state administered protection systems. As you can see in the diagram, the county administered protection system has a dual role, those, those green boxes at the bottom under the county side for emergency adult protective services, or um, that's when DHS or MDH are also uh, responsible for the report. The county is also responsible for the protection of the person. And the county is the only lead investigative agency under the Vulnerable Adult Act, whose role is both to investigate the person alleged responsible and also to engage the person um, that they investigated, often the vulnerable adult or a family caregiver in protective services. And APS's dual roles can be in conflict with an outcome to both um, investigate and also then engage the same person in services to stop the maltreatment and reduce risk of reoccurrence. Uh, next slide. So uh, media and, and other coverage is often about vulnerable adults in long-term care facilities or services licensed by the health department or the Department of Human Services. But as you can see here in this 2019 and 2020 data from the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, that Minnesota counties are responsible for responding to more vulnerable adults that have been reported as experiencing maltreatment than both the health department and DHS combined. Next slide. So the Vulnerable Adult Act um, historically was established um, in the 80s without funding for adult protective services. And county administered adult protection relies heavily on county funds for operating this program that provides critical protection for vulnerable adults living in their own homes or in the community. For tribal nations, there is no dedicated state or federal funding. In 2012, and again in 2019, the legislature added partial state funding for um, county delivered adult protection. 
And then in 2021, the first ever, ever federal funding dedicated to adult protection came through the Administration for Community Living through the COVID um, relief bill. So this was um, groundbreaking for adult protection. And next slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the redesign and the, um, the bill and um, amendment. Next slide. As many of you know, DHS is leading a redesign process to update and modernize the Vulnerable Adult Act for Adult Protective Services. And a group of more than 260 stakeholders have been involved in this process. And again, I'll emphasize from the slide with the colored bubbles, this, pro this is um, focusing on county delivered adult protection. And what we heard from stakeholders, those 260 stakeholders, was that our adult protection system lacks statewide consistency. Um, and I think this is what um, Representative Frederick was referring to, that vulnerable adults receive a different response depending on the county responsible for that report and response. We also heard from stakeholders that we need to shift the balance from focusing on investigation and blame of the person responsible to a person-centered assessment and engagement with the vulnerable adult and their support persons and have an outcome that focuses on safety and dignity and preventing maltreatment or maltreatment reoccurrence. We also heard from stakeholders that they value privacy for the vulnerable adult, but that there is a necessity to allow data sharing or information sharing for coordination to increase that person's safety. And we also heard from stakeholders that the lack of, the, of a stable funding system contributes to inequities um, across the state in the service response that's received. So we've been working with um, our partners to develop a more person-centered equity-based adult protection system by redesigning the role of adult protective services under the Vulnerable Adult Act and House File 1432 aligns with these changes. Next slide. So what's included in 1432, you may remember when we presented this bill last year in this committee, um, and as Representative Frederick mentioned earlier, this bill is the first phase of the Vulnerable Adult Act redesign. It's part of a multi-year collaboration and coordinated effect, uh, effort to develop policy changes that support statewide consistency and equity for safety, dignity, and service outcomes for vulnerable adults. Above are some of the outcomes from the Vulnerable Adult Act phase one, and we anticipate bringing a funding request forward in the next phase of the redesign. But a few of the highlights from, from this bill are that it improves clarity for county adult protective services to share information with other agencies, guardians and healthcare agents, not only for investigation of the allegation, but also for protection of the person. And that's a significant change. And we also add, add that counties must make their guidelines for accepting vulnerable adult reports for adult protective services available to the public. And this will add consistency and transparency so that vulnerable adults and their families and support persons know how to understand which reports may meet the county's threshold for services and investigation and help vulnerable adults and their families and supporters understand why some reports are not accepted or that's sometimes referred to as screened out. Next slide. So the amendment also aligns with the Vulnerable Adult Act redesign and it has some um, primary points to supporting county authority to share data for the purpose of protection of the vulnerable adults with tribal nations when the vulnerable adult is a tribal member and with case managers when the vulnerable adult has a case manager. It also allows county agencies to offer assistance to the reporter or to the person who was reported when the report is not accepted or is screened out for adult protective services or investigation. And ultimately the amendment emphasizes assessing the person and the incident and using that information to create a safety plan and engage the individuals in protective service interventions rather than uh, focusing on investigations. Service interventions stop and reduce risk of maltreatment, which will improve outcomes for vulnerable adults. As this will change the focus from investigation of who is responsible to the maltreatment when there's an informal caregiver or families or a family caregiver and really helps support the family and support the vulnerable person to getting help and getting connected to services, which is going to lead to a, a person-centered outcome for them. And next slide. Um, Nicole Stockert 
is here and her contact information is listed here if you have further questions. Thank you, Ms. McGurin, for that presentation. Um, so with that, members, we also have a bill that is related to um, House File 1432, which is Representative Noor's bill does not yet have a bill number, but Representative Noor, this is a, the funding bill that goes with the adult protections. Do you want to quickly um, discuss your upcoming bill? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, as you've already noted, uh, thank you so much uh, for the informational hearing on this proposal and very important set of issues. Uh, this proposal complements the adult protection bill you just had. I want to thank uh, Representative Frederick and the department for the presentation and also continuing on this uh, discussion and various county organizations for bringing forward and supporting phase one of change for adult protection system in Minnesota. As you had, adult protective services are essential for Minnesotans because they respond when all older and vulnerable adults living at home or in the community at the risk of financial exploitation, emotional and physical abuse, or neglect. These are complex cases, and APS workers must have a variety of social work tools at their disposal to ensure that the adult is protected treated with dignity and respect and provided with comprehensive next steps to help prevent abuse from occurring again. Unfortunately, the funding mechanism for adult protection do not yield the result Minnesotans need. Unlike child protective services, there is no federal funding allocated for ongoing adult protection work. While there's a small amount of state grant funding available and used by counties, most of the spending in adult protective services falls directly on the county itself. This has made for patchwork system, depending on where vulnerable adults uh, live in Minnesota. They may not receive the same services and intervention as those in similar situation in other parts of the state. Just a couple of months ago in December 21, 2021, uh, DHS briefed lawmakers on recent report they commissioned that allowed that showed how Minnesotans is far behind the rest of the country when it comes to cases accepted. Uh, there's a link uh, online that gives you that data. Uh, on key uh, takeaway on that is Minnesota, Minnesota only accepts 24% of eligible cases, while the national average is over 62%. That also shows that uh, the, there is a screen out of 76% compared to 37% nationally. So especially for BIPOC communities or individuals with mental health issues or substance use disorder. So members, uh, this bill will complement the department's phase one efforts by providing some much needed funding until further phases of the department plan come into fruition. It will, uh, this uh, bill as written right now, subdivision one and four create fund working group to help imp uh, implement some of the recommendation from the DHS recently commissioned and produce these findings. Uh, subdivision two, provide one-time state funding for counties to help address caseload coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and bridge us to the next budget cycle. Subdivision three, uh, funds pilot project for counties to develop new ways to address the inequities in the adult protection systems. I know the current grant funding mechanism in subdivision two may need some technical tweaks and I look forward to uh, continue to work with uh, Representative Frederick and also the department and all stakeholders to make sure our adult protection system is funded and designed in a way that works for all Minnesota vulnerable. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I have individuals who want to testify on this issue. Okay, I'm going to give the testifier just two minutes. So uh, let's see, we have uh, Amanda Vickstrom with us. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Chair Schultz and members of the committee. My name is Amanda Vickstrom. I'm the Executive Director at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center, and we are a statewide nonprofit organization that provides support and advocacy services to victims of elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. Um, we strongly support the funding proposals in Representative Noor's bill. Since our founding in 2014, we've partnered with county APS agencies and DHS 
and we strongly encourage addressing these structural uh, inequities within our APS systems so that APS can provide better protective and supportive services to vulnerable adults, many of whom are older adults living in their own homes and in the community. We know firsthand with our direct work with victims and their families that the public is either confused or unaware of the adult protection system and can be very frustrated when county APS declines to open a case. In July of 2021, when DHS released that evaluation report of the adult protective services standardized in intake decision tool, um, we really believe that's a call to action. And it tells us two important hard truths First, Minnesota does lag behind the rest of the country in providing adult protective services to vulnerable adults. And on average, our APS system provides services um, to only 24% of the eligible vulnerable adults experiencing maltreatment. And that national average is at 62%. And second, two groups of vulnerable adults that are experiencing maltreatment are statistically more likely to be screened out of APS than any other group. And those are racial and ethnic minorities and persons with mental health issues, specifically chemical dependency. So what the report doesn't show is how that historic underfunding of county adult protection uh, has really left our older and vulnerable adults behind. Without any significant state or federal funding, we really over rely on county budgets to fulfill the mandates of the Vulnerable Adult Act. We applaud DHS's approach to a full-scale, multi-phased approach in updating Minnesota's APS system, as you heard in relation to HF uh, 1432. But still, we know that the significant updating to adult protection, including the changes called for in the report, cannot happen without additional resources. We believe the one-time funding put forward in this bill uh, will help bridge the gap until the state budget is properly adjusted to support equitable provision of APS services. We look forward to working with the department, with you all as lawmakers and other stakeholders, uh, to continue the redesign of APS uh, so that the Vulnerable Adult Act works for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vickstrom. So with that, members, we'll be bringing back House File 1432 and Representative Knorr's bill to take formal action. And finally, members, we have one last bill on our agenda. This is House File 2818, and the motion is to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance and Policy Omnibus Bill. Representative Rasmussen, I don't see an amendment. Would you like to explain your bill? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Pioneer Care and its staff in Fergus Falls do great work providing nursing home services and other services to the aging loved ones in our broader community. I know personally, as my grandparents have spent time there, uh, all of them uh, either as residents or volunteers. Uh, Pioneer Care, like the broader long-term care industry, is facing challenges due to staffing and other impacts from COVID. In fact, Pioneer Care was among the first facilities in the state to receive staffing support from the National Guard and has been at the forefront of discussions on the workforce crisis in long-term care. House File 2818 seeks to address Pioneer Care's particular situation of having the capital costs of a new facility while having missed the new property payment system that is currently used to reimburse new or upgraded facilities. Uh, the bill before the committee would allow Pioneer Care's nursing home to access the new property payment system, which more fairly compensates nursing homes that have made large property investments that improve the experience for staff and residents. The new property payment system was put in place in 2019. From that time on, any new projects approved through a moratorium exception get the new property rate system. Without this bill, Pioneer Care would need to seek a new project through the moratorium exception to get the new property rate system. Because Pioneer's nursing home was built uh, brand new in 2010, there isn't necessarily a need to make any additional capital investments at this time. In the lifespan of a building, they basically have a brand new building. So the moratorium exception process is likely not the appropriate answer for Pioneer Care's unique situation. Uh, for these reasons, Madam Chair and members, we are seeking a limited uh, legislative solution in this bill. Uh, Madam Chair, I have one testifier for the bill, Nathan Johnson, who serves as the administrator of Pioneer Care. Um, I also have uh, Jeff Bostic from Leading Age Minnesota, who is available to answer questions as needed. 
Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Mr. Johnson, welcome to the committee. Just please state your name and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Nathan Johnson. I'm the uh, I'm a nursing home administrator. I'm the CEO at Pioneer Care up in Fergus Falls. And just for a point of clarification, Jeff Bostic did have to jump off the committee, I believe, to attend another meeting. So it's just me. <laughs> but um, thank you, Representative Rassman, for that wonderful summary. Basically, that's the issue for us. I think I can just add a few a few comments of context. Um, and talk a little bit about the impact of the disparity that we feel in our property rate. Um, we operate a 105 bed nursing home in Fergus Falls. We also operate assisted living dementia care facilities, 70 units in total. We operate independent living apartments, 44 units in total. And we operate uh, home and community-based services that serve about 600 people in the surrounding area. We built the new nursing home in 2010. And by doing that, we made uh, significant capital investment for our community to improve the experience for our residents and for our staff. We're very fortunate to have a beautiful building that's still very new. Unfortunately, we find ourselves with a very large disparity between our property rate and our capital costs, specifically depreciation and interest expense. I believe we may have one of the largest disparities in the state. I get that information from the most recent cost report comparison data provided by DHS. Uh, for example, our depreciation and interest expense on a per diem basis um, equals about $64.08. The 90th percentile for all other nursing homes in the state um, equals $34.79. So the takeaway from that is that our expenses in those two areas are basically about double the state's 90th percentile. So that translates into quite a bit of dollars for us. And just to put that in terms of do in dollars for our little nursing home, uh, between depreciation and interest expense, we have about $1.8 million this year that we will expense. Our current property rate, which is $19.91 per patient day, uh, provides us with about $700,000 in designated rate to cover those expenses. So this means we're diverting about $1 or $1.1 million from other resources to help us cover these capital costs and doing so, of course, at a time when we're severely impacted by the workforce shortages and, uh, and the consequent occupancy challenges. So this bill would seek to uh, fix that disparity and um, we, appreciate, uh, uh, we would appreciate the help of this committee to see that through. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, to the testifier, um, would this bill then necessitate that a new appraisal of the facility be uh, completed prior to the rate, new rate being calculated? Mr. Yeah. Johnson? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I, yes, m that is my understanding. I've, I've worked on this with Jeff Bostic at Leading Age Minnesota who I suspect many of you know, and he assured me that it would require a new valuation of our nursing home. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the testifier, how, uh, how soon can that uh, appraisal be completed? Mr. Uh, Johnson. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I don't have an answer for that, but I'd be happy to follow up on it, get back to the committee right away. Thank you, Representative Albright. Madam Chair, I see that the uh, Deputy Commissioner for DHS is on the call. I'm wondering if he would be uh, willing to respond to my questions because I understand that there may be some delay in the uh, payment to the uh, facility based upon this uh, uh, appraisal. So certainly want to encourage Mr. Pollock to uh, uh, expedite that as soon as possible. Commissioner Pollock. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Albright, I, I think this is a little, it's a related issue in the sense that this facility is um, definitely experiencing uh, a variety of funding crises, and we acknowledge that. I think the issue in front of the committee is um, more about the process for how we normally do these kinds of applications with more term exception projects. Um, so I can I can let some other DHS folks weigh in here as well if you want some you know technical feedback about this issue. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, I'll just leave it in the capable hands of the commissioner to complete his work in a timely fashion. 
given the fact that that nursing home relies upon his work to stay in their beds and stay warm in a climate that does tend to be very, very cold this time of year. I see that we have Val Cook with us. Val, Ms. Cook, would you like to um, respond? Good morning, Madam Chair. I can respond technically to the question about timing of the appraisals. Um, can you so give your name and affiliation first, please? Sure. Valerie Cook with uh, the Division Director for Nursing Facility Rates and Policy at DHS. Regarding the, the um, technical question about timing of the appraisal, so the fair rental value system is relatively new. We're, we are only um, a few months away from the first one to enter that system and have arranged for an appraisal. But to beyond that one appraisal due to um, contracting procurement guidelines, we will need to issue a request for proposal um, to a competitive bid for an appraiser to do this work. And so, um, you know, that will take a few months. And that's where we're at. So we don't currently have an appraisal system under contract that can immediately respond. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Representative Albright. No more questions, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Representative. And thank you, um, Ms. Cook and Commissioner Pollock. Representative Rasmussen, any final comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to have a hearing on House File 2818 today. I hope we are able to address Pioneer Care's unique situation by giving them access to the new property payment system and help them continue to serve our aging neighbors in West Central Minnesota and look forward to working uh, with you, Madam Chair, and DHS um, on this bill moving forward. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. So House File 2818 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our finance and policy omnibus bill. And members, just to make sure that this is clear, the motion was to lay over House File 1754 as amended for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill as well. Okay, members, we will be meeting on Thursday um, and I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. So looking forward to discussing more bills with you tomorrow. And with that, we are adjourned.